All right, guys. So let's talk about the boxing drill, the basic boxing drill. Um, I'm here with Bob, and we'll be going through this demonstration. We've also got some other video of how to work with the pads. Uh, so if you got somebody that's got some focus mitts, um, you want to work with them, that'd be great. <clears throat> but I really wanted to make one video that kind of covered a bunch of different stuff. So we're going to go through the basic drill just right off the bat. Then we're going to start talking about just some concepts of uh, the, the basic type of boxing that we do. Uh, and then also how to take that boxing drill up to the next level. So depending on where you are, you can skip to what, whatever you need to be. Um, but we're, for right now, we're just going to talk about the basic bare bones uh, boxing drill. I even hate having just... Um, our, our new Stamalia logo on it because this really fits in and plugs in with just about any martial art that has a jab, cross, hook, and upper, uppercut, which is every martial art that's out there. So, <clears throat> uh, most martial arts are going to have something sp specific that they want you to do whenever you're punching. If you've got any kind of background with any kind of boxing, like true boxing, or any martial art that taught you how to strike, I have no problems with you all uh, at all uh, bringing that into this particular drill because that's that's what you've got. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the basic stuff here, but just like I mentioned before, this is a jab, cross, hook, uppercut. Okay, and that's it. So if you already know how to do a jab, cross, hook, and uppercut, then you've got the basic boxing drill. Okay, so the jab is going to be your, your lead foot, right? So whatever, um, in, in Filipino martial arts, we try to keep our hips square to the target as much as possible. Actually, the, the hips are square beyond the target, right? It was a moving arc, so they would be, uh, wouldn't be focusing on a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. They would be moving through and uh, ducking through, and so they would keep their hips in the uh, direction that they're running, <laughs> not running along in a sideways really fashion or whatever. But that same type of idea, um, if you're in the, the military or shooting, stuff like this, this is a very much a fighter's, right? Fighter stance with the, with the gun just, just here. I do have a jab side, right? So I've got it right and the left. So my jab side is gonna be the weaker of my two. It's my non-dominant side so if you want to use that as a as a cue go for it and the jab is just just that it's just a jab <clears throat> now um different schools of thought are going to have different things for example if you want to put your hips into this jab and put some power or some some body into it by all means go for it uh, but it also doesn't have to. The idea of a jab is that it's going to be quick and it's going to get in there, but it's not necessarily meant to knock them out. Um, there's a real concept that's playing here where if you're, uh, if you just fling something at somebody's eyes, for example, it could be like a paper cup, just something completely benign. They're still going to respond to it and react to it just because something's coming at their face. That's a lot of what the jab is. And if you're in a confrontation, I like this kind of uh, uh, verbal judo type of de-escalation type of stance. And then all of a sudden, either they make a move or you realize that this is, this is going to come to blows and you have to make your move. That this is, it should be lightning quick. It should also just be something to set up something else. If they've got their hands up too, I know Bob doesn't have any limbs up here right now. But if he did... <clears throat> this is probably going to be one of those things that I see an opportunity. I see where his hands are maybe a little bit wider than he intends them to be, or maybe things are moving around. Maybe he's got them out here now. And so I feel like rather than really putting my body into it, making this punch a little bit slower, my jab is going to slip through and just, just hammer him, right? So that's all it, yeah, all it is. And even though I say hammer him, I, I just mean hit him because that's all the jabs job is is just to make contact give him something to think about while i set something else up okay so that's the jab jab and then my cross is going to have my hips and my whole body into it really this is the point where i would normally say okay you're gonna uh if you if you're in my class we will usually have just worked on power strikes or something like that to set this up because the concepts are exactly the same 
you're going to use your hip rotation. You're going to draw power up from the ground first, kind of using the, your, your, the, the, the inside of your big toe, if you will, on your dominant side to really kind of push and thrust that hip uh, that uh, on the side that you're punching. So if you're, if you're punching with your dominant hand, your dominant side hip is going to be thrusting forward. That's going to get your legs and uh, the lower part of your body involved, as well as the intercostal muscles all the way up. Everything's contributing as you're going to now cross with your right. Make sense? Now, Again, this is going to have a little bit of concepts pulled into it because as I do my cross, I don't want it to let it hang out there. I don't want to just do this great cross and then just sit here waiting for the next thing and maybe do another great jab that's actually across and uh, with just with the other hand. <clears throat> so I want to get out of that particular habit because as a Filipino martial arts guy, as a small circle jujitsu uh, that's that's kind of folded into our art. That's kind of what we're hoping for, right? We're hoping that somebody just punches and lets their hand just hang out there in space forever so that we have a chance to do something with it. So instead, whenever you do your jab and when you do your cross, it's going to be out there and then you're going to pull it back with the same amount of force that you push it out there with. On the, on the cross, what that's going to mean is that I'm going to use my hips to get it back, right? So I'm going to... Use my hips to get the cross out there, and I'm gonna do the reverse on my hip. I'm gonna pull that hip back uh, that's been extended to get my arm back into a position where it's close to my body and not floating out there in space. Okay, so that's the jab cross, right? Ah! So I, and I might do this jab a couple of times. If this jab uh, the first time doesn't do what I want it to do, there's really no point in me throwing the cross because he might be ready for it at this particular point. The problem with throwing any kind of punch is now the game's on, right? So if I throw a punch and it doesn't land or it doesn't do what I wanted to do, then I might be committing whenever I do my cross. But for the drill, <laughs> gotta get back to the idea that this is just a drill. So for the drill, I might do a one jab, jab cross, or I might do a jab and then a jab, Jab cross, right? So, and I just left my arm out there like I told you not to do. But this is what, this is the jab cross part of your jab cross, right? And so then you come back. I really like this as a reference point. That's something, I'm a real tactile person and so I like things touching my face. Uh, the covers and stuff like that that we do in the different martial arts, I, I like feeling that on my own skin. So whenever I do my jab and I pull it back, I know you don't have to get it right there on your face, but I like that sensation. I like just knowing that I've completed my punch out there and I'm bringing it back. Okay, let's talk about the hook. <clears throat> now, obviously a hook can be to the head, but for our jab, cross, hook, uh, uppercut uh, drill, this is a hook to the body. So it's gonna be a change in levels. Also, it's a change in distance as well. So if you're doing a jab, which is fully extended, and a cross that's fully extended, then you can expect your hook to be exactly half of that, right? So if you're working on a bag, excuse me, or a, uh, a bob like this, or <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you're working on, if you're working on something that's static, this is when you have to take that little slight step to change the range. If you just do jab, cross, and then you try to make your hook connect at this distance, you're gonna be doing weird things with your wrist uh, and your arm to make that hook connect. So jab, cross, step in slightly, bang, and then I've, you've got your hook right there to the body. And what you're going for is you're going for the, that, that floating rib area, right? Bop, right on the side of the, of the bob. If you've been taught from other martial arts or anybody else to throw your hook with your knuckles flat or your horizontal, that's fine. I don't want to break up any types of habits that you've got particularly right now. But there is another way to do it. This is the way that I prefer just because it seems to lead less to injury. Um, if you know anything about boxers fractures, you can look them up. This is typically the way that you get them is if you let your, your pinky lead 
uh, be the furthest thing out away from your body when you're throwing either a hook or a uppercut. So what happens is if I'm if this is a perfect situation or if this is a static thing that I'm striking, then I can get my hooks in this way with my knuckles horizontal and there's no problems, right? I'm always hitting my mark. Uh, typical rule of thumb, uh, and this is something we didn't mention earlier, is that you're trying to strike, whether it's a jab, cross, hook, uppercut, doesn't matter. You're trying to get with the big two knuckles and you're trying to line them up with the rest of your forearm bones, all your wrist, forearm, all the way to your elbow it makes basically a straight line. That way, when you're impacting the face, you're exerting force on them, but the same amount of force is coming back through your arm. And so by lining up all these things, you're really strengthening everything. The problem with hitting th something accidentally with your pinky, and I say accidentally because that's the way it happens, is let's say this is not static, and he moves backwards as I'm trying to throw my hook. And let me, say, uh, let me think that I maybe I try to reach out there and catch him. If I catch him with just that pinky, it's not gonna take long for that pinky just to give up because it's not made to take that kind of force, especially at that shearing type of angle. So by turning your palm to face you or your knuckles are uh, <clears throat> vertical rather than horizontal, you're gonna save yourself. You might feel like you don't have quite the range that you do whenever you have your knuckles uh, horizontal in your right, but if you miss this way, then at least you're not leaving your pinky out there all by its lonesome, right? So if you'd rather make contact and save your pinky, go for it. <laughs> if you'd rather miss than injure yourself, then do the uh, pinky's horizontal. So when we're talking about this in the context of the drill, it's a jab cross, and then whenever I step in slightly, then I'm going to do my hook this way. Try to make sure that the elbow stays at least even with your fist as it makes contact. You can kind of ex exaggerate that just a little bit and get your elbow just a little bit just to make sure that you're gonna make contact with these first two uh, knuckles. But I wouldn't try to get into the habit of really exaggerating that elbow movement. Uh, you definitely don't wanna have it down though because now you're still hitting at a weird angle. Uh, and then at some point it becomes a hammer fist. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's just the way it goes. So get down, uh, drop your level. The way you're gonna drop your level is not by bending your hips, but by bending your knees so that you're not gonna be off balance. You're not gonna be shifting your center of gravity out over your toes. You wanna just have your center of gravity even just shrink down, okay? So you're gonna change your position and then light them up. Same thing here is I'm still gonna engage my hip as I throw it out there, okay? <clears throat> then the uppercut. So the uppercut is going to be on the right side or my dominant side. Uh, I, I'm right-handed, so this whole drill is done uh, left with my jab, right with my cross, hook with my left, and uppercut is gonna be with my, my right. Same concept, I'm gonna have my palm facing me as I do my uppercut. Uh, I, since I'm already down on a different level to give my hook, then all I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna just be shifting my body weight slight, slightly and then taking my hip and throwing it into this. Part of the power that you're gonna have on an uppercut is just from you standing up, right? So it's still through the hips, but it's just the extension of my legs. Uh, don't over exaggerate this. I don't want to see the street fighter, you know, hadouken whenever you're doing your uppercut. Uh, it also, your hands should not drop ex extremely low trying to build up power as it goes through. Remember, the, the more time that your hands spend away from your face, even in preparation for a punch, that's just time that it could be there protecting you. So yeah, my hook, and then I'm just going to shift my body over and give myself the ability to turn my hips. I know you can't see my hips. Turn my hips and stand up as I do my, my uh, uppercut. And then again, it's 
making contact. I'm not gonna go super crazy with it. Just gonna make sure that I make contact and then I'm gonna return it back to its base. And then if I'm doing the drill rep, uh, uh, one right after the other, then this is whenever I'm going to step back and now I'm back at uh, full length striking weight range, okay? So that's it for the basic drill, right? So you got the jab, cross, hook, uppercut, and then you're back. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. Okay, then you're back. <clears throat> uh, now let's get into some of the more concepts. I know we've already talked about a couple of the concepts, but let's talk about some other ones. If, if you've never thrown punches before, uh, these are great. You can grab some different gloves. <clears throat> you can grab, uh, I, don't, I don't care if you get like the MMA type gloves where they've got the fingers uh, exposed and you just have padding on the actual knuckles in the back of the hand really uh, these are great these are fantastic to work with um, after a little bit of time they start rubbing the skins off your uh, uh, these are a little bit worn so they they, they tend to kind of rub the skin off around my knuckles but it's kind of cool it's badge of honor right uh, you can get the full length boxer glove uh, the, the, the 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 real deal <clears throat> These are great too. They really protect your hands. They do a fantastic job. They've got this little link here between the uh, mitt and where your thumb goes so that you can never catch your thumb on something and have it ripped backwards as you're striking through. So that's really great. Also has very good wrist support. And if you, if you do any kind of punching on a heavy bag or whatever, and if you do it just barehanded, especially while you're learning, you are going to roll your wrist. It's just something that happens. Uh, kind of expect that and go slow and go easy as you're getting progressive, uh, as you're progressing into it. Just because all it takes is there to be a little bit of bend in your wrist or for you to strike the pad or the heavy bag or whatever it is at a weird angle and that wrist is gonna go one way or the other. It does not feel good. So <clears throat> having the mitts like that is great because it protects against those things. But at the same time, you got to understand that if you get into a, <laughs> if you get into a situation, a real life situation where you need to punch somebody, you're not going to have them. So it is good to get at least a couple of strikes in with just your hands and no mitts at all uh, to be able to get that feeling and get, get that uh, precision in your strike where you're not compromising your wrist and you don't know it, or not using the uh, support, the wrist support or the thumb support on the bigger gloves as a crutch and don't know it, right? So just, just know yourself. Uh, but, it, but then again, if we're talking about just kind of pros and cons, if you just work with just your hands on the bag, you will never get massive amounts of reps because your hands will tear up. Uh, and I know about the videos online of the people that punch in the trees and stuff, but you're talking about a long time of practice where they can do that. And, and even then their, their hands are still torn up after that, I'm sure. So if you want to get some more reps in, you can, uh, you can start off with no gloves. And then uh, once you got your hands nice and good and red and ready to go, then you can slip your gloves on and get some more reps. So, but whatever, whatever you want to do, go for it. Okay. <clears throat> so that's for the, the stuff that you need. I'm just going to insert a little thing here. You don't need a bob or a heavy bag or, or even a partner. If you, if you have nothing at all, and you don't need gloves either. If you have nothing at all and you want to work on some type of boxing, you can just hang a, a piece of paper. And I'm talking, you know, out of a binder or, or, from a printer or anything. You can just poke a hole, hang it from a string off of anything, and you can still get your uh, jabs and crosses in. And I will tell you, if you're using a piece of paper, what you're going for is you're going for making contact with the paper and you wanna make sure that you're, make, do, you're doing everything else right, that you're slowing everything down, you're making sure that you're getting it just perfect. And as you're making contact with the paper, you, you want the paper to pop but it's not going to go very far. 
What you don't want to do is, and this is real easy to do on like a heavy bag, is where you punch and when you make contact, instead of putting all your power into it and then pulling it, snapping it back right away, is that you'll punch and push, right? And that makes the heavy bag swing and it really looks impressive and everything's great. Even on these bobs, you can kind of knock them over, right? You can punch and you can kind of push. And what that is, is you're making contact with your hand and you're lingering on that contact and you're pushing it away from you. Same thing can be done on a piece of paper. It's really telling on a piece of paper, right? Because the piece of paper has so much wind resistance that just by hitting it like this, bam, is not gonna make it move very far at all. It's not gonna swing, it's not gonna do very much at all. But I mean, you will see it hit and you'll hear it get hit, which is really satisfying. But it's not gonna really be swinging all over the place like a regular bag would be. Um, but if the paper does start to move forward and backwards, it's because you're lingering on that punch or maybe you're punching, you're targeting too far past. That's another concept is that you actually uh, target past the individual's head when you're punching. Bad idea. You don't want to be in, the, in some form of a you know, partial lockout of your arm when you make contact with your face. Uh, or with, with, that, with whatever your target is. So you don't wanna have to have all the extension for past their head in mind and then make contact early. It's just like making contact early with any, anything else, a punch or a baseball, you know, hitting a baseball or whatever like that. It's just not good. All the power is when everything is locked out. So working on that targeting with that piece of paper is fantastic because you get to know your range really well you get to know that you're not making contact and kind of pushing through. You're, you're making contact and, push, and pulling back. So there's a uh, budget option for, for anybody that's interested in it. Okay, some more concepts. Again, with the hook being like this, <clears throat> anytime that we're doing any of our strikes, I like the palm to be facing us just because it protects the pinky. And like we were talking about, those first two knuckles are what really what we're trying to get at. Now, if we start talking about hammer fists, now we're switching entirely. I'm not hitting, I'm still not hitting with my pinky. I'm hitting with the bottom part of my fist. Also, the same thing is true with palm heel strikes. So if even if you do have pads, but you don't have gloves, no problem. Just switch over to palm heel strikes. Palm heel strikes are fantastic. They are, um, <clears throat> sometimes people might think, okay, well, you're slapping them. No, you're not. You're basically putting a punch, but you're using that heel part of your hand to cushion the blow. The typical concept is that if you're going to use something hard, like your knuckles, on something of theirs that's hard, like their forehead or their, or their skull, something's got to give. Right, and the skull is kind of built to have a bunch of punishment. So what you're probably gonna find is you're gonna, you know, crack some knuckles or, or, or whatever. In the moment, you probably won't, aren't gonna feel it, you're just gonna keep going. But still, if there's a, a way that you can protect yourself, I'm all for it. Palm Hill strikes. If I was gonna throw a cross at this guy, <clears throat> and I've got it as a punch, then I can be right here. But if I do a palm heel, you can see there's a little bit of gap there. So I am losing a little bit of distance. Also, with a, a, a regular fist impacting his face, I gotta make sure that my wrist is lined up with everything, right? If I have it off at, at a weird angle, then it's gonna just, all the force, instead of traveling straight through the back of my arm, now it's going to come out the, the, the earliest point and it's going to put a lot of pressure right there. Same kind of thing is true for a palm heel strike. I need to make sure that I'm still impacting with the part of my palm that's in line with the radius and the ulna that's in here all the way back to the tip of my elbow. If I can, if I can make this all the way back to my shoulder joint, that's even better. But even if this is like a... Uh, and I'm boxing his ears, or which is kind of like a, a hook, but uh, with a palm. I still need to make sure that I've got at least more behind that than just my hand. If you impact with the feet, uh, the fingers instead of the palm, 
then you've got the same problem as if you punch improperly. So that concept is very important, but you're going to be making contact, right? Bang! With the palms of your palm heel instead of, uh, instead of the feel, uh, uh, instead of the fingers or even the flat of the hand. You don't want to use that part of the hand. You really want it just to be exactly what it sounds like. Palm heel strike. Bam. Bark. And again, with the sound effects, you got to have the sound effects. So <clears throat> that even works on the hook. Does not work very well on the uppercut unless you completely turn your uh, hand and you face your uh, fingers back to your own face, which I don't like, but it can be done from down there. So if you are in, cl in close and they've got their hands and everything all around you and you find yourself in this position, bang, that could be totally fine, right? Okay, but for the drill, for the <laughs> Filipino boxing drill, I'm sorry, not the Filipino boxing drill, the basic uh, boxing drill, it can be jab, cross, hook, ah, I just mixed them there. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut, or jab, cross, hook, uppercut, right? That, either way could work. Or any mix and match. If you want your full extended strike, so like your jab and cross, to be palm heels, and then everything else is gonna be uh, a, a fist, especially the body strikes. The, the concept is hard to soft, soft to hard, right? So if, if I'm, if I'm going to use something hard like this, but I'm going to strike, some, strike something that's relatively stop, uh, uh, soft, like their side or their belly, then that's totally fine. <clears throat> if I want to use something uh, soft, like the heel of my palm or the base of my palm to strike something hard, then that's totally fine too. Where I get into trouble is trying to use something hard on something that's hard or something that's soft on something that's soft, right? Okay, so those are the concepts. <clears throat> um, also, just as a basic general concept with uh, Anis Tamalia in particular, you do wanna try this both ways. So you'll, you'll spend some time, the majority of your time at, at, at the very beginning in your, in your fight stance with your preferred Stance. So your, you know, for example, my jab would be my left hand because that's my dominant hand is my right hand, and that I want that for the cross. But there is a lot of of benefit to switching it up and just getting the feel for it. It's gonna feel funny, and it's gonna not feel like it has any power at all. That's totally fine. Just feel it and work on it, and over time you'll get the feeling. And you'll still have the same mechanics. They just, for some reason, they just feel different on the other side. Somebody that's truly ambidextrous, I just haven't met that person. They can bat right and left-handed, but for them to truly feel exactly the same, regardless of side that they're doing, I just haven't met that person. So make sure that you're working it on both sides. Um, by the way, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying, I, you know, my limited group that I've uh, met of people on this planet. I haven't met that particular person um, or at least it hasn't come up in conversation. <clears throat> so let's talk about taking this drill to the next level. Anytime we're doing this drill at the very beginning when we're, uh, when we're, we're, we're learning it, it needs to be static. I need, uh, besides that little step that we do to, to get a little bit closer, my target needs to be static and I relatively need to be static. My feet need to be planted firmly and making good contact with the ground. Uh, please don't do the punches where your back foot comes up off the ground. I know you couldn't see my back foot, but it came up off the ground. I felt like a little bit like a ballerina. Don't do that, right? So this is this this all needs to be there relatively. Uh, with very few exceptions, I need to have my weight centered in my body. I need to be able to move forward and backwards and side to side and diagonals and everything like that with relative ease in this particular stance. If I find myself leaning into the strikes too much, um, that might put a little more power on the strikes, but what you're giving up is you're giving up mobility. 
because at, when you lean like this, now you either have to take the time to correct before you move somewhere else, or you have to move on that same line that you started moving on. So <clears throat> it makes makes for a little bit more of a predictable situation. Whereas if, if I'm just here centered and I'm static, then I can get a lot of good work done. But again, this section is about taking it to the next level. When is a fight static? Never. So as I'm uh, progressing and I'm getting familiar with the drill, now I can start moving around. If I have something static like a heavy bag or a bob, then I move, right? So I will move around my target. Even bob that's facing this particular way doesn't mean that I can't do my same hook from a different angle and hit them in the, the side or the back <clears throat> rather than just, I'm sorry, in the, in the front or the back rather than on one of the sides. Uh, obviously being doing my uppercuts and stuff like that will take a little bit of getting used to especially uppercuts with a heavy bag in particular are hard because then you just like kind of scraping the side of the, uh, the the front of the heavy bag so you adapt and you do whatever you can <clears throat> but as far as movement it, it's good to do the around but also the in and out right so at this particular point I can't make contact now I'm gonna move in for my strike and move back out this is a very, very valuable thing is knowing your own distance. And so as you're taking this up to the next level, I'll be staying out here, out, and hey man, I don't want any trouble, wow, bam, bam, right? So then you've got your jab cross and then you're right back. Or yeah, or, or you can even play those scenarios out, hey man, I don't want any trouble, bah, bah, and then you're back at your re uh, original distance. You don't even do the whole combination, but you can. You can have start out here and then you're, Jab, cross, hook, uppercut, and then now you're in close. And you know later we can talk about uh, elbows and hammer fists and all that kind of good fun stuff. Knees and you know, <clears throat> the basic boxing drill is is meant to be that, but you can still take it up to the next level. If you are working with somebody that has pads, they can move around also, so they can stay outside your range, and then they can move inside and give you present your targets and then move back out or they can give switch things up on you certainly getting out of just the basic pattern jab cross hook uppercut if you can change it up a little bit also if you uh the basic boxing drill you can change anything you can do two jabs and a cross you can do a jab cross jab you can do jab cross jab uppercut right so you're still doing the jab cross jab and now you got to move in on the uppercut you can do jab cross uh i'm drawing a blank because just the, the possibilities are almost infinite you don't have to stay with four you can do jab cross cross right jab cross hook 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 on the other side hook right I mean, it just gets monotonous uh if you're only doing the same four strikes at uh <clears throat> all the time so especially if you're working with a partner try even having them call off the uh, the count count blah, blah, having them call out the combination and have them switch it up and i know that takes brain power because for one thing they've got to enunciate and say it loud enough for you to hear it and then you've got to put it in your brain and then you've got to execute. So there's, now you're holding more pieces. Uh, if you wanna get really crazy and you've got two partners, you can have one behind the, uh, the partner that you've got with the pads <clears throat> and they can be holding out uh, different numbers on different sides of the body and you have to call back to them what number it is. So. Uh, let's say that somebody was behind Bob here and Bob's a real person. He's calling out combinations. I'm doing my jab cross and I'm, I'm having fun and I'm trying to keep up with this. And then all of a sudden the guy behind Bob <clears throat> puts a two over his right shoulder. So I would say two, you know, and now I'm going to keep going with this. Uh, don't make it too crazy. Don't be doing like complex math and algebra, writing them up on back blackboards and whatever behind you can go too far the other direction, but play around with it. Try to figure out how to make your mind work while your body is 
And th this is this becomes really important because typically the rule of thumb is fight or flight or freeze, right? Fight, flight or freeze. What we don't want to do is we don't want to get ourselves in a position where this is a situation that I've got total control. There's no stimulus, especially with a heavy bag or a bob. There's, there's no <clears throat> expectations on me at all. So besides my, my physical interaction here, there's nothing challenging my brain at all during this whole situation. <clears throat> Whereas in a real fight, you might have tables and chairs and people and thinking about the exits and trying to trying to figure out, okay, should I really be fighting this guy? Or should, you know, what in the world's going on? Maybe scanning for weapons, seeing if he goes down to a, to a hip or inside of a pocket or if his buddy goes into a pocket or something like that. And so what will happen is if this is all we're doing and all we're doing is the same four box, uh, four punch combination, it's never going to get taken to another level where it's going to be useful for us in a stressful situation unless we try to get as close as we can to adding that stress. Now, obviously I can go into, <clears throat> I can go into a, uh, a place and pick a fight and hope that I can get some stress inoculation that way. But that's not a good idea, right? That's, that's just, that's not how we do it. So we're gonna do it safely. We're gonna try to do it with other stimuli. We're gonna try, keep trying to pile it on until our brain is able to handle all that stuff and, and still do the drills and still do things well. So I know this has turned out to be a longer video than I expected. <clears throat> I'm still gonna show you the part with, if you have a partner and we'll, we'll walk through that as well. But as far as the basic boxing drill and some of the concepts, this is it. This is all we've got. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. <clears throat> you can put a hip into the jab if you want to, or you can leave it out. Do palm heels if you want to, or you can leave them out. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility in this particular drill. Uh, so get out, have fun, see how it works. Get the feeling of punching something. Even if you don't have anything uh, to work with as far as equipment, get out there at some point and try to go to a gym that maybe has a heavy bag hanging up or talk to a friend because it is different. If you're working on just that piece of paper, actually punching something is different. And likewise, if you're the person that does have all the fancy equipment, get out there and spar or do shadow boxing. This is fantastic. Shadow boxing, and I'll spend just uh, one quick minute real quick. Shadow boxing is <clears throat> kind of like uh, the dry fire whenever we're talking about a handgun. This is the imaginary target. This is the uh, imaginary situation. <clears throat> Uh, the good thing about fighting an imaginary opponent is you know you'll always win, <laughs> but they can be pretty challenging opponents, and you can have it to where you're you're fighting one, bop, bop, and then another one comes in from or, uh, from behind you. You've got different situations. Really, you're only limited by your own imagination, <clears throat> and there is a lot of good things to be said about visualizing different movements. And they, they count as uh, uh, not the same as actually doing it, but they count in a different way of doing it. Just visualizing yourself going through that, thinking about the, the punch, how it's going to make contact, how it's going to come out from your body, right? No windmill type stuff, uh, no dangerous stuff with your hands. So a lot of that stuff you can work on with shadow boxing and other types of drills. All right. Again, thank you and have fun and we'll see you next time. All right. So if you're working with a partner and you've got the focus mitts, this just talk about this for a little bit. So the focus mitts, um, some people like to uh, give it a jab cross. Some people like to keep going. <clears throat> they like to like hit into the strikes and it gives a little extra pop, but you don't have to just do a cross, right? So I kind of come and meet it out and it's very, 
impressive because whenever you can get the pop to really sound good, you can really pop it and you're giving them a little bit more feedback um, as they're striking something. But you don't have to. You can just leave it there solid. And the main thing that you're looking for is for the mitt to have a consistent place where they're punching. Good. What you don't want to do <laughs> is do something like this and then move it back. Yeah. You don't want to have them try to chase it down. For one thing, it's really frustrating for them. Uh, it's also bad for your own shoulders, but it's also really bad for them to hyperextend and, and continually uh, throwing these punches full force and not connecting with something that's helping break, right? H helping uh, uh, slow down their punch at the very end. And it's and, and really the joints are taking the full brunt of stopping that uh, strike. If they're striking out there expecting to hit something and they don't. So give them something consistent to work on and just keep it there. They are also in control of their own distancing. If they get too close, and they're kind of eating their own punches, then they need to move back, not you, right? And the uh, same thing if they're a little too far. If they're banging their joints, but you're being consistent here, they need to pull themselves in, not you, right? You don't need to go out there to meet them, okay? All right, good. So jab, cross, hook, uppercut. We talked about when we were on the, bo on the, on the body bag that if you're the one doing the jab, cross, hook uppercut you have to change your own distance when you're doing the hook and the uppercut because the hook and the uppercut don't reach as far if i'm working pads i can help this right so i'm not going to chase them down i'm still giving them a consistent place but i'm going to have my jab cross at one distance and then i'm going to have my hook closer in towards them so they can go jab cross jab cross hook right they don't have to change distance on me. If, if they want to get used to do that movement in and, uh, and I feel confident in their skills and that they're going to hit the, the pad and not me, then I can make them make the, the, the movement. So jab, cross, hook, and then you move in. Yeah, jab, cross, hook, that's it. So if I want to do that, I can. But to make it easier on my, uh, on my partner, at the very beginning, I'm going to do that work for them. So jab cross is going to be here. My hook is going to be extended out towards them at a good spot. I'm still looking for their rib area. Again, for this drill, I want this to be at their head height, not mine, right? So I want it to be at their head height, and I want my hook to be at their rib level, not mine. Okay, so if you've got a real tall person and a real small person, the real small person is going to have to reach way up to start off with. Over time, they can compensate for different height levels. But when you're starting out, to make it easy, their head height and their rib height. Okay, jab, cross, hook. Good. Jab, cross, hook. Okay, makes sense? Now, if we're putting the last piece, so they're going to do all four strikes. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. I'm still going to do the same thing. If they're beginning out, I don't want them taking that step in and launching a strike towards my face. So I want to do this instead. I'm going to jab cross. While they're doing the hook, I'm going to extend out and I want to put my pad at about their chin level. Okay? So that they can get that uh, practice of doing that hook, or I'm sorry, that, that uppercut at their own head height. Okay? So it's going to look like this. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. Make sense? Jab, cross, hook, uppercut. We also talked about before how you can add on to this. This is great if, if you, as the, as the uh, focus mitt holder, hold your, hold your pads on your chest. That's kind of the universal symbol for don't hit yet. <laughs> and then whenever I flash a strike, I might say one, two, Bam, bam, and then I'll pull it back. And then if uh, if I really want to do this workout, then we'll start moving around. Obviously, we got the camera going, but I can move around. Flash one, two, bam, bam, jab only, bam. And this is a great drill just to be able to flick that jab out there. So jabs only, bam, jab, good, jab. 
Cross only, bang, right? So we can work with this. Hook only, bang, right? We can do a hook on the other side, which is cheating, but we can still do it. We can do uppercuts, bang, right? Make sense? This is all stuff that we can do with the pads, and we, we keep them here until we want them to, to, to light us up. We can also uh, not just move around, but we can start incorporating, uh, step this way just a sec. So we can in incorporate, hey, she's de-escalating, she's got her hands up, but they're not in fists. They're kind of like, hey, relax, relax, right? Bang, and then I push, and now I've got my, uh, then she'll come back and re-engage. Well, I'm chasing her down and she'll, she'll engage the pads. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do with mitt work. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to do. So get creative. You can also use these for hammer fists. You just point them up uh, and let them do hammer fists. You can think of different situations where they would do a one, two, pop, pop, and then they, they might do a hammer fist on one side or the other. Same thing with elbows. These just work great. Um, if you don't have a whole bunch of different focus mitts or pads, you can use these for, for knees where you kind of double up here or some of the, some of the few kicks that we do in Filipino martial arts. Um, although kicks, these are not great for kicks. <laughs> they tend to fly through them. But knees, they'll work. Uh, elbows, they'll work. And certainly anything into him. All right, thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. Continue to work and train. Uh, and you got to make the sound effects. If I mean, I wouldn't be doing martial arts if I didn't couldn't do sound effects. So the pop or the bang or the bop pow, whatever old timey Batman symbol you want to put in there for example. Yeah, let's just start that over.